Welcome to this presentation about how meanings about sport and physical activity have changed over time. The syllabus will focus specifically on the beginnings of modern sport in 19th century England and colonial Australia. Now this part of the syllabus looks at links with manliness, patriotism and character. Now, sport initially was a male domain and its purpose in earlier times, particularly in the 19th century, was to develop characteristics of manliness, which is the tendency to display male characteristics. Uh, sport was viewed as an opportunity to showcase manly characteristics such as strength, power, competitiveness, courage and discipline. It was also an opportunity to showcase what's called patriotism. And sport was an opportunity to show patriotism to a particular country. British patriotism, because um, obviously the British colonised Australia, and so when they arrived here, they still uh, celebrated their British heritage. But also patriotism for the new colony of Australia, which... Uh, included a great rivalry with, uh, with Britain, particularly in games such as cricket uh, and rugby. Uh, this also linked to fighting uh, and developing characteristics for defending the nation. And sport was viewed as a, a breeding ground for people that were patriotic to their country, showed bravery and were willing to fight for what they believed in. It also developed character. Sport was seen as an opportunity to build character. Sport was considered as a male domain. The idea of muscular Christianity was synonymous with sport. Muscular Christianity focused on using sport as um, an institution that would help develop the character of young men into competitive, courageous, disciplined and upstanding men with fine Christian morals. question that you need to consider is, is manliness expected in sport today? Are the characteristics of manliness still fostered and developed in sport? Is it still on show through sport at a younger level and also at the elite level, professional sport? And does sport still promote patriotism today? If you consider Australia's national teams, Whenever we participate at large international events, you'll often see the flag and people's faces being painted and the green and gold colours everywhere and people really getting behind Australia. So it is an opportunity still to celebrate country. The meaning of amateur and professional sport is another aspect that has changed dramatically over time. The idea of amateur uh, and professional uh, sport was to um, separate the classes. So in the 19th century, amateur sport was reserved for those people who did not get paid and were of higher class. And the professional sport was for those who wanted to get paid. Uh, and they were predominantly working classes. And this characterisation... Uh, was used to separate the upper from the working classes. Um, the amateur sport was for upper class people, obviously who were wealthy. They received no payment to play and they were considered true sportsmen. They did not believe in using their skills to make a profit. And some examples of amateur sports in the 19th century were cricket, rugby, golf and tennis. Professional sports, on the other hand, were sports that were played by working class uh, people who needed to receive payment to play. They needed compensation or money to cover time lost uh, from their job or at work um, or through injury. So professional um, sports were rugby league, AFL and boxing. The best example of the amateur and professional um, characterisation is rugby league and rugby union. Now, rugby league 
uh, was a breakaway code from rugby union. Rugby union was the original sport, and it was an amateur sport, a sport where the players did not get paid. It was a sport that was reserved for those that were of higher class, um, uh, and there were players amongst the rugby union uh, fraternity who really wanted to get paid because they still had day jobs and they wanted to get paid so that they could cover time lost through injury and so on. Daly Messenger was a rugby union player who was considered the superstar of his time. He crossed over to rugby league for a quite a large sum of money and so began the game of rugby league, a game for the working class where the players were paid for their efforts. On the other hand, cricket was seen as the gentleman's game in the 19th century. Women's historical participation in sport. Women did not really participate in sport in the early 19th century, and it was their participation was defined by social expectations of the era. Women just were not expected to participate in or exert themselves in any way, uh, particularly not sport. Uh, women were expected to be fragile, pale, feminine, sedentary, decorative, and the fashions of the era uh, were very restrictive. Uh, and basically, they just couldn't really participate in sport. They were meant to be decorative and, and dressed nicely, uh, meant to be motherly and, and nurturing and so on. There was a whole lot of other ideas around at the time, particularly the fact that sport was considered to be harmful to the female anatomy. And that was a medical profession uh, view at the time. And that really deterred a lot of women from actually participating uh, in, a, in, a, in any real meaningful way. Um, some other social expectations of the, of the time included those of Pierre de Coubertin, who was the founder of the modern Olympics. His views at the time were quite influential. He did not believe that women could could physically rival men and they could not uh, push sport um, faster, higher or stronger, which is the core precept of the Olympics. He also failed to see the appeal of women's events running alongside uh, the men's at the games and he viewed it as impractical, uninteresting, ungainly and he believed that female uh, events of the day were improper. So this was the founder of the modern Olympics. You can see those expectations at the time would have deterred a lot of women from participating. However, over time, we saw um, female participation increase and we saw great sports people, particularly Australian Sarah Fanny Jurak, who uh, was our first gold medal winner, first female gold medal winner uh, in the 100m freestyle in 1912. Uh, so she was a pioneer. And there are other pioneers who actually played a role in inspiring a generation of women to participate and take part in sport. Athletes such as Shirley Strickland, Margaret Court, Dawn Fraser, Betty Cuthbert and Kathy Freeman. But there's more. there are more reasons to explain why females have increased their participation over time. The women's suffrage movement of the 1900s, which was um, a women's right to vote, at the time, led to increased power and respect for women. And this played a role in women playing a larger uh, part in society and therefore um, impacted on their participation in sport. The feminist movement of the 60s and 70s, social expectations changed and female capabilities were acknowledged. Greater independence due to feminism, leisure time. The benefits of physical activity were realised um, in society and, and therefore... Um, realistic views about capabilities for women were accepted and they were, they were based on facts rather than what um, the ideology was at the time. And, and obviously those pioneers were able to ex inspire a generation of participants. So at the end of all of that information, you need to be able to answer some key questions. So compare the nature of sport in the 19th century with sport in today's society. So in other words, what's changed over time? Well, clearly, the idea of amateurism and professionalism in the 19th century um, was a clear class divider. So if you were an amateur, 
you were definitely wealthier, um, of higher social status, uh, but you didn't get paid because you didn't need to get paid because you were already already wealthy. On the other hand, professionalism was set aside for those that didn't have much money. They were working class uh, and they wanted to get paid because they couldn't balance a job with sport. So if they had to play their sport and had to take time off work, they needed to get paid. So some great examples of that is the, is the uh, rugby union and rugby league divide in the early 19, uh, 1900s where rugby union was considered amateur, they didn't get paid, and rugby league was a sport that began out of players wanting to get paid. So they crossed over from rugby union to rugby league so that they could get paid or compensated for their, for their time. So the question that you need to be able to answer is how have the meanings of amateur and professional sport changed over time? And today, do those meanings still exist? Well, amateur sports people today aren't always necessarily of a high social status. An amateur sports person today may just be someone that doesn't get paid. They play socially on the weekend uh, and they don't get paid. A professional sports person, on the other hand, is someone that may be quite elite and playing their sport for a living. So they may get paid a lot of money, which may essentially enhance their social status. So the meaning has changed um, to a degree, although there are still some some divides when it comes to class. For example, rugby union is still played in the majority of exclusive private schools, and rugby league is still played uh, in the western uh, areas of Sydney where it's quite strong, and they may be considered working class areas. So that still kind of exists, but generally the meaning has changed over time. For different social groups, um, again, different social groups... And, and social classes, okay, in the 19th century, of course, we saw those people of, um, of higher social status um, playing sport for different purposes, playing sport for sportsmanship, um, for the true um, um, honour and privilege of competing with other people. And the working class may have played sport to survive, to earn money. Um, sports like boxing, uh, rugby league, um, early sprinting races uh, like the stall gift were activities that were designed to, to help people to earn money. Um, so the meanings of sport were different for those different social groups. How did women's participation women's and men's participation uh, differ and why. Um, we, we heard earlier in the presentation that women's sport, uh, that women didn't play all that much sport. Uh, and when they did, it was only sports that were not too strenuous. Um, women could probably play a little bit of tennis, although they couldn't exert themselves too much. Uh, they could do swimming. Swimming was considered... A reasonable sport to do because there was no body contact involved uh, and men were able to participate in a range of sports to develop those characteristics of strength and discipline and courage which were those uh, that were expected of men at the time. Um, looking at how it's changed over time uh, sport was largely um, a competitive pursuit uh, however Today, we can see that we have large sums of money um, paid to broadcast sport. Um, so that's a big part of sport today, and money's generated to be able to pay players, to be able to keep uh, clubs um, financially viable and so on. Sport is now a commodity, which means it's a, it's a big business. It's something that can be uh, bought and sold off to the highest bidder, um, this is something that wasn't really as, as prevalent in the 19th century. Athletes now receive uh, endorsements and are able to and are able to earn money through a range of different uh, sponsorships to help them to focus on their sport and maintain a level of professionalism. Uh, the stall gift race. 
uh, is a sprinting competition uh, that originated by providing a gift or prize to miners in the gold fields in the in 1878. Uh, the race is still run today. It's held in uh, Storwell, Victoria, attracting many competitors for the challenges, uh, and there is a cash prize. So that's a, a race that a professional race offers a prize. It's been running for a long time. It's a race that's still run, but you can see <clears throat> sponsorship involved, and there is a large cash prize today. That brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening.